Well, I'm scared, wouldn't you be? <laughs> Nervous as a cat, my grandmother would have said. I began in a mood of gratitude. Immediately to Pauline Yu, Sandra Bradley, and Sarah Peters. To Tim Lloyd, Lee Herring, Steve Stumpfley, Kurt Dewhurst, Diane Goldstein. Deeply to my colleagues, friends, and family who has sustained me during this life of learning. When he received the Nobel Prize, W.B. Yeats said he should not have been alone. The association is preposterous. I know, I know. But this is as close to the Nobel Prize as I'm going to get. <laughs> and Yeats had a knack for putting my thoughts into words. We do not work alone. I can accept this astonishing honor only as one in a collegial circle, as a member of a minor discipline not previously represented in the distinguished sequence of Haskins lecturers. Two, Yeats said, should have been at his side in Stockholm, Lady Gregory and John Millington Singh. With him, they had driven drama to a modernist breakthrough simultaneous with, simultaneously with Kandinsky's in painting. Like him, like me, they were folklorists. Lady Gregory ignored academic conventions and listened to the peasants of Galway, embracing their interests, their interests, in history, mystery, and the sacred. John Singh asserted and subverted his philosophical preoccupations in writing the first great folkloristic ethnography, The Aran Islands. Lady Gregory and Singh. Yeats described Lady Gregory as an old woman sinking into the infirmity of age. My old woman was my grandmother Alice, who was born in the log cabin her father built after defeat in the Civil War. Slight, sprightly, and vain, she changed the date of her birth in the family Bible, <laughs> making herself younger. But she came into life only two decades after the war, and she was raised with the stories with which she raised me about hard times in Mosby's Confederacy. The farm, worked by her family since early in the 18th century, lay not far south of Manassas, and the spring plowing turned up cannonballs and rusted bayonets. There, on that piece of earth, listening closely as the old people talked, I learned from my grandmother that, in Faulkner's words, the past is not past. It's all around us, a vital, palpable reality. History matters. John Millington Singh, dead then, had become for Yeats a young man's ghost. The ghost in my mind is my handsome young father returning home from his war. Staunchly of the political left, as I am, he wanted to stop Hitler, and he volunteered on the day after Pearl Harbor in the year of my birth. Serving in the Navy as a radar man and the Admiral's tennis partner from the beginning to the end of the Pacific War. For difficult duty in those last violent days, he was granted the right to be the very first American among the antique shops of Kyoto. <laughs> I have no clearer memory. My jaunty young father in his crisp uniform, bouncing out of a jeep and carrying a bundle into the hallway of my grandparents' home. The bundle opened to reveal a red silk lining and a black lacquered box, powdered with an abstract patterning of flowers and gold. It was the first thing in my life that I recognized to be beautiful. It remains the primal ground of my aesthetic, and my young father used it to teach me that the Japanese people were not enemies but makers of wonders, creators of art. It breaks through the senses to capture the mind with electric directness. Art matters. From my old woman, history. From my young man, art. Before I'd learned to read or given anything much thought, history and art had become the points around which I would swing the ellipse of my life of learning. In time, I would find that the marginal, ruthlessly interdisciplinary discipline of folklore could accommodate both, both history and art, with grace. 
Folklore provided me at Tulane, Cooperstown, and Penn with kind teachers. I name with love Kenny Goldstein. At Penn and Indiana, it has given me wise colleagues, a multitude of marvelous students, and a beautiful wife, Praveena, who is also a folklorist, a teacher, a field worker, and a writer of books. You understand why I think about Yeats. They should all be standing with me now, for all of them have helped me on my life's mission. Doomed, but personally fulfilling, that mission has been to make more democratic the idea of history, of human significance, and the idea of art, of human excellence. To make more democratic is language too loose. Among my predecessors as Haskins lecturers, some who were mature professionals in the turbulent 60s feared with reason the rise of an ahistorical relativism that would flatten distinctions into mediocrity. Well, relativistic to the core, I was among those who inspired their fear. <laughs> One of the kids who stormed Washington right out here tear gas in the air, who stormed Washington after the murders in Kent State. One of the white boys of Southern ancestry who marched loyally behind their black leaders in the civilly disobedient fight for civil rights. I wanted change then. I want change now. But I have no wish to abandon history or obliterate this distinction between art and lesser things. I seek through realms of neglect for the principles by which the ideas of history and art can be improved, widened through experience, sharpened through logic, to be more inclusive, of more use to more people. I begin my seeking at home on a particular landscape, as did Don Meinig, the previous Haskins lecturer, to whom I am intellectually closest. My landscape has a red clay lane a neat white house with scrawny dogs and crazy old uncles on the porch, an orchard, fields rolling east to the Chesapeake and west to the Blue Ridge. Mountains made the horizon of childhood, and early on lugging a heavy recorder and mad to intellectualize my heritage, I went up to the Blue Ridge to find the elders who told the old tales my grandmother did tales with numbers in the Arne and Thompson Index of International Narrative, who sang the ancient ballads in Professor Child's collection. I found them, it was not hard, and visually inclined I found the buildings, the cabins and barns that materialized the style of the old stories and songs, structurally rigorous, passionate in restraint. Buildings that met my unreconstructably modernist taste a taste conditioned by the principles, the functionally rational and social principles that Wright and Gropius learned from William Morris, that William Morris learned from English medieval architecture. Precise, at once humble and proud, the mountain's buildings were, for me, artistically fi far finer than the pretentious mansions that filled the volumes of architectural history. At that moment, exactly occurred the luckiest event in my lucky life, a chance encounter in upstate New York with Fred Bowerman Niffen. Mr. Niffen was a renowned senior scholar, a geographer and anthropologist at Louisiana State University, and the author of the most important paper ever written on vernacular architecture, Louisiana House Types, published in 1936. I was at the time an undergraduate student of anthropology and English at Tulane, just south in New Orleans. I regularly drove north. Mr. Niffin gave me a bed in his garret, showed me all the photographs he'd taken with his old Leica, and he taught me everything. He was my master, my mentor, my chief of my men, as Morris was for Yates, and he graciously welcomed me into collaboration. We divided, Mr. Niffin and I, the American land between us along the Appalachian axis. The East was mine. And with Mr. Niffin's affectionate direction, I learned. Learned from lanky old gentlemen in bib overalls, some black, some white, and more from their buildings, photographed and fastidiously measured. I learned 
that architecture provides quantifiable evidence of distinct American regions. And it contains a history, a vast American history, not caught in books. In an analyzing buildings for history, my master was a geographer. And eventually, my closest comrade would be an archaeologist, Jim Dietz, author of the classic In Small Things Forgotten. I dedicated books to Fred Niffen and Jim Dietz. I miss them right now. Architecture does not teach a history of smooth evolution, but of the will asserted of revolutionary moments followed by long stretches of adjustment. The great changes were not powered by the elite, as trickle-down histories would have it, nor by the wretched of the earth, as I might wish, but by middling farmers and artisans and merchants who rearranged their domestic environments before the politicians could frame their ideologies or start their wars. Americans had united and separated from England before the Revolution. The South had left the Union three decades before the Civil War. This I learned on my undramatic native landscape, then tested in Europe and Asia. The buildings say that the great changes happen among workers on the ground in advance of the violence to which change is customarily attributed. My conclusion is that the landscape, with buildings at center, provides a resource that is wider in reach through society and time and space than the writings of the literate few. The very best resource for composing a more democratic history of the long stretch of continuity and change that runs from 1200 to 1900. I concur with W.G. Hoskins who urged historians to get out of the study, look over the hedge, and learn the complex but comprehensible landscape, language of the landscape. So I began at home on my landscape. Then I went east to Ireland and England, to Turkey, Bangladesh, and Japan, south to Nigeria and Brazil, conducting the projects that, more than shifts in employment or academic promotions, divide my life of learning into phases. My task in learning has been to manage a productive relationship between reading and experience. Many traits connect my predecessors as Haskins lecturers. Dominant is an orientation to history, which I share. Another is an association with Harvard, which I don't. <laughs> a third is a love for reading. That fits. We live, Pravina and I, in a library ornamented with too many pots and rugs. Aided by the world's antiquarian bookmen, we gather around us the books we need and, fortunate to hate televisions and computers, I get many hours to read every day. Through reading, great writers and thinkers, above all William Morris, have become my companions. But in the dialectic of my learning, experience leads. I am at last, at heart, a field worker. Clifford Geertz, in his Haskins lecture, used the word brutal. The difficulties are real. We all get seriously sick. And it's very easy to turn the errors and pains into anecdotes. But I find field work more exhilarating than difficult. It's thrilling to be so steadily awake and aware as I settle into new places and stay long enough to learn the language. Pauline asked about languages. I'm good at Turkish, OK at Bengali, uh -huh. also Italian. We, we shouldn't be I shouldn't be digressing. We have things to do. You've been sitting here a very long time. So I say, what I do is I love field work. I love field work because I think something happens to your body. Literally, I think there's a chemical change which causes you just to be thrilled and exhilarated by the fact that you are awake the whole time, you have to pay attention to everything, no matter how minute. You write it all down. You learn the language. You make the friends who fill up the tapes and notebooks. Luck upon luck. I was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship at 30, and drawn by our writers, by Yates and Joyce and Beckett, of course, but more by Eston Evans and Sean O'Sullivan. I chose Ireland. My desire was to do a piece of field work that could meet the standards developed during a scatter of acts in New York and Pennsylvania 
Virginia, North Carolina, and Louisiana. Inspired by anthropological ethnographers, in particular Oscar Lewis, my aim was to study a rural community, not one that was isolated into timelessness, but one that was pulled apart and pushed together by the cross currents of history. It was 1972, the bloodiest year of the Troubles, the year of the massacre in Derry. And I settled into a place on the embattled border, Ballymanone at the river's mouth in the county Fermanagh. By day they cut turf and hay and followed the damned old cows. At night they sat by the hearth in the convivial chat of the Cayley. Meanwhile, newsworthy history surrounded them with helicopters in the air, soldiers on the road, and bombs in the night. To understand, I came into colloquy with Ballymanone's own historians, Hugh Noel, Nolan and Michael Boyle, and with their neighbors who did not claim and were not granted the high name of historian, but who were also knowledgeable about their place in its past. Peter Flanagan, Hugh Patrick Owens, the widow's Jimmy Owens. The philosopher among them was Hugh Nolan. He was born in 1896 in the house his grandfather built out of slap brick. And there, farmer, old bachelor, and saint, he lived in one of the house's two black rooms. Mr. Nolan had studied in his youth with the historian Hugh McGevney, who was, they say, a great wit and a fine hand at dressing a stack of hay. And he taught me as old Huey had taught him. During conversations that continued until his death in 1981, I learned Hugh Nolan's idea of history. Hugh Nolan built his historical practice in a series of logical moves. Truth was first. The last time I saw him was in the old men's ward at the Urn Hospital in Enniskillen. Mr. Nolan defined his life's goal as keeping the truth and telling the whole tale. The truth he knew is more than the factual. The facts shift and accumulate into contradiction, but the truth he said is what collecting and assessing the facts you are willing to live by. Truth guides. Lies put the mind and soul at odds, causing the tongue to stumble, but the truth flowed sweetly in his mouth, keeping him young and empowering him to tell the history his neighbors had to hear. Bringing him personal pleasure and enabling him to fulfill his social obligations, truth was first, as it must be for all artists of nonfiction. Space came second. Histories that spread too wide, snapping free of particular earth, inevitably, Mr. Nolan believed, fall into falsehood through omission and abstraction. Hugh Nolan's thinking was like Fernand Brodel's, who faced with the task of world history, recognized that it must begin with distinct civilizations limited in spatial extent. Mr. Nolan's region of responsibility stretched only 10 miles south and west, eight miles north and east, but still he felt that any single chronological line would omit too much. In his third move, the move to time, and again like Braudel, he divided time into simultaneous streams flowing at different rates. To account for the fast history at the fluttering surface, Hugh Nolan employed the concept of progressive development, an idea that's used too often to explain too much, but he restricted it rigorously and responsibly to the technological sphere where it sometimes actually works. And he set technological progress against an equal and opposite force of regress in the social sphere. As things get better materially, he argued, they get worse socially. Hugh Nolan lived long, saw much, and summarized by saying, the two things happen at the one time. Things get better and they get worse. Deep time, the historian Mr. Nolan divided into two realms, so slow in their motion as to yield the constant conditions of human existence. In the realm of faith, the heroic saints of the Christian dawn arrive in Fermanagh and leave signs on the land, counters to doubt that prove the existence of God. To love one's neighbor is the eternal commandment. In the realm of conflict, the heroic warriors of the Irish past repetitively resist invasion 
and bring death to their neighbors. Their acts are valiant, their hope is victory, their risk is eternal damnation. That's the message Hugh Nolan delivered to the boys who built the bombs. In a Sartrean manner, within a Brodellian frame, Hugh Nolan and his colleagues exemplified continuity in the intellect and realms of faith and conflict by narrating specific events of spiraling typological significance. Their tales set for their neighbors the dilemma of virtue. The good must love, the brave must fight. In this life, between faith and conflict, there is no choice but choice. So what can we do, the defeated peasants cry at the end of Fontamara. Carry on, said Hugh Nolan. Carry on, he said, and propped his hope with parables, with truth-filled stories about people he'd known, country people, contadini like those who gathered at the small fire in his miserable house. By day, the people of story worked the land, courageously enduring through conditions of famine and war, bodily decay, and jury labor. At night, in the sociable ring of the Cayley, the gifted among them, George Armstrong, John Broderson, Hugh McGevney, John O'Bray, became stars, glittering against the prevailing darkness with spectacular feats of wit, with hyperbolic Beckettian narratives that made hardship, pain, failure, even death, into a hilarious joke. Set in their historical dilemma, alive in a predicament of violence and deprivation, they found the consolation of art. The consolation of art. So you see, my life of learning, driven by experience, has recapitulated the progress of ethnography. The purpose is always to write honorably and usefully about other people. But once I sought informants to provide texts for my analysis, then I dug deeper for the native concepts that could improve my interpretations and patterns of presentation. But now I seek colleagues, fellow intellectuals like Hugh Nolan, who having been trained differently in different conditions, can collaborate in the solution of grand problems that have proved intractable within the confines of our fractured academy. Aspects of Hugh Nolan's thought find parallels in the writing of the great French thinkers who have word over history and influenced my work. Marc Bloch, Fernand Braudel, Jean-Paul Sartre, Claude Lévi-Strauss, but Hugh Nolan, bent, blackened, impoverished, but Hugh Nolan, his mind ground sharp by hardship traded sequence for significance. He situated his vision tightly in space, split time, oriented his discourse to moral problems and joined the geographical, the religious, the political, the military, the economic, the social, the technological, and the literary <laughs> into a comprehensive program that made him my master of history. In Mr. Nolan's system, history is the means by which conditions are understood. Art is the means by which they're overcome. History and art. Four years after Hugh Nolan's death, I found my master of art in Ahmet Shaheen. Ahmet Shaheen was born in 1906 in Kutahya, an ancient city in western Turkey. The mountains rising around Kutahya carry Dumbledek, a white clay that has been exploited since the 15th century to produce splendid ceramics, ware painted under glaze in a composite body called chini, a word cognate with China. Trained in the workshop of Hafiz Mehmet Amin Effendi, Ahmet Shaheen became the leading designer in his city of 10,000 potters. When the cruel wars were over and the Turkish Republic had been established, Ahmet Shaheen formed a partnership with Hakicini Giolo to bring their city's wounded industry back into vitality. Their work challenged and inspired the masters of subsequent generations, Ahmet Shaheen's son, Zafir and Farouk, Zafir's son, Ahmet Hiriyat Shaheen, and his wife, Nur Ten, Hakim Ermunju, and Sutka Olchar, Mehmet Girsoy Ibrahim Erdair, Mehmet Kocher, Ismail Yit, I must say these names. From all of them, I learned 
but Ahmet Shaheen filled the center. We were walking on the street one day when Ahmet Bey stopped and told me I had learned enough to write a book about Turkish art. I should write a book, he said, and he should be its kahraman, its hero. <laughs> Eventually, I did just that. But intending to compliment him, at that time, I called him the Son Usta, the ultimate master of Kutahya. No, he corrected me. He was the ultimate master of all of Turkey. <laughs> and now, correcting myself, I would say that Ahmet Shaheen was the greatest master of Islamic ceramics in the 20th century. One of the three most important ceramic artists of the 20th century, along with Bernard Leach in England and Shoji Hamada in Japan. During conversations that ran from my arrival in 1985 to his death in 1996, Ahmet Shaheen offered me the most coherent formulation of an idea of art that was shared widely by Turkish artisans, by the weavers and potters and carpenters and smiths who welcomed and taught me. Ahmet Bey's idea of art, logical and widely applicable, contains direct solutions to our problems. Basic is a definitional problem. Weak definitions do little damage during research on the canonical monuments of Western art, but they befuddle cross-cultural study. Societies develop hierarchies of media coming to place high value on certain techniques, their allied materials, representational goals, and functions. That's as true in the West as it is in the East. But if the Western appreciation of painting and sculpture is used to separate art from craft and extended to societies different in value, if people are approached as painters and sculptors when, say, textiles and ceramics mean more to them, which is true for most of the world's people, then their excellence will remain out of focus, and during comparison, intellectual inquiry will descend into a rhetoric of Western superiority, an excuse perhaps for an invasion, if not by soldiers, then by educators. Turkish artisans, too, arrange media hierarchically. At the top, they place calligraphy, the beautifully measured inscription of God's word. They rank carpet weaving high and basket making low. But differences of medium and function are not used to separate art from other things. Biographical accidents provide people with different opportunities for self-expression. Some are calligraphers, some make baskets. But what makes art is not chance, but will. The will to dedicate oneself sincerely and completely to the task at hand. Some calligraphies are art, some are not. Some baskets are art, some are not. It depends on the will and skill of the maker. I recall farmers sitting in with tea in a village, Karagermlik in Chinakali, and talking about hunting. All men use shotguns to kill rabbits for dinner, but one of their neighbors they called a true artist. He blew the brains out of bunnies with consummate elegance. For Ahmet Shaheen, art comes of Ashk. Ashk is the passion of lovers separated and pining for embrace, the passion of the Sufi who yearns for reunion with God. It's the passion of artists who, longing for perfection, forget all else and devote themselves utterly to the task at hand. Art for Ahmet Bey does not lie in the eye of the beholder, which is always, he said, less acute than the artist's eye, but in the mind and hand, the heart and soul of the creator. And this thought of Ahmet Shaheen's echoes in writings by Suzuki in Japan, Kumarasmi in India, and Kandinsky at the dawn of modernism in Europe. Not art is the perfunctory, the thing done for money, not love, even if appealing even if it takes shape as painting or sculpture. Art is passion incarnated through skilled action in any medium. That's what Ahmet Shaheen thought and said, and it is an existentially grounded, portable, rigorous definition of art. Tradition locates another of our problems. 
just as art can be casually identified by medium, normally among us by media dominated by prosperous white males, tradition can be casually used to separate old art from new, conventional from innovative, parochial from cosmopolitan, folk, folk from fine. But Ahmet Shaheen would agree with T.S. Eliot that all art is traditional. The Turkish word for tradition is gelenek. In explaining tradition, potters in Katakya, and here I'm following my dear friends Mehmet Kirsoy and Ibrahim Erdeir, who followed Ahmet Shaheen, potters in Katakya don't speak of handing things down, but of artists alive and breathing amid conditions, inevitably. From birth, the artist breathes in the air of an environment, absorbing influences intentionally or not. The air circulates within, missing with the silt of the deepest self. And when the artist exhales in creation, the result will perpetually emit the hava, the air of a place, a time, a culture, and an inviolably unique individual. As Robert Plant Armstrong argued in his marvelous trilogy, the work of art is an object encountered as a subjectivity, a presence that fills the void left by a missing person. If art this thing will be always and at once, old and new, traditional and intensely personal, a seal of the self. Why sign the work of art, James Joyce wondered, when the whole damn thing is a signature. Ahmet Shaheen's formulation solves also our problem of communication. Since the work of art contains, by definition, the creator's fullness, it stands as an exhibit of zevk. Taste is a dilute translation. Zevk is a style of life, a chosen code of conduct that gains material presence in an artifact style. The beholder, too, has a zevk, which is matched during evaluation with the zevk in the work, and a swift, direct, nonverbal communication links the beholder with the creator. They connect through the qualities sade, janle, or jidi, plain, playful, or virtuosic, that abide in an object made by one, apprehended by another, and judged, perhaps favorably, perhaps not. Folklorists guided by Del Himes and Dick Bauman have long known that this is how society is built. Laws set far boundaries, but the inner territory is configured in performance by creative acts, tales told, <coughs> pots thrown, lectures given, that attract some, bore some, and repel others in the continual restructuring of social relations. Turkish artists intend connection and more. They intend benefit as Hugh Nolan did in telling his stories. And they regularly put it like this. To the artist, art is ashk, the yield of love. To the beholder, art offers a merivan, a stairway of ascent. The beholder in ascent, like the artist in creation, becomes wholly engaged body, mind, and soul. The art that lifts them together is the most human of things, useful and beautiful and intellectual and spiritual all at once. On the stairway's first step, art offers a gift to the hand, an aid in labor. On the second step, art offers a gift to the eye, an aesthetic st stimulus that pulls the mind in through the senses. On the next step up, the mind is informed through the historical references embodied in style and content. On the top step, the mind, having learned, awakens the soul to the wonders of God. You can say nature awakens the soul to the wonders of God. God is beautiful and loves beauty, the potters say. And their art is one of the abounding beauties of the earth that, like the signs left on the earth by the Irish saints, bear witness to the existence of God. Turkish artists intend to build a society, not one that is merely connected, but one that is founded on moral precepts and governed by love. Love is the force that drives creation. Love is the force that drives creation. We're at an end, friends. 
always communicative and moving, and inevitably traditional, an embodiment of taste and devotion, art is, in Ahmet Shaheen's terms, passion incarnate, and in Hugh Nolan's, a gift and a consolation. What we do when we are sincere, engaged, responsible, art is the best that can be managed given the unruly conditions. In our scale of values, though not in Hugh Nolan's, the fictional ranks higher than the factual. Novels get more praise, but scholarship, my work and yours, can be art. And it is art when done with a passion for learning and exposition. It is our art, our consolation. Sufficiently fulfilling, I have found, to carry us through these massively disappointing times. Near the Buriganga, in his cramped, damp shot in old Dhaka, Hori Parapal shapes clay into murtis, images of the deities that are worshipped in pujas and temples by his fellow Hindus. Hori Pada learned his art in the village of Norpara from his beloved grandfather Naroda Prashad Pal. Then he traveled, learning more and rising to be the greatest sculptor in all of Bangladesh. We became close immediately, he said, because in some former life we were married. <laughs> and we were sitting on the floor of his shop in the outrageous heat, sweating and holding hands, when he told me that his work had not brought him riches or fame, but it fills his days, benefits others, and whatever it is, he says, it is enough. My resources are different. Instead of clay, I have thick notebooks and piles of tape and thousands of photographs. I've got different tools, cheap pens already charged with ink, paper ready ruled. But I set about my daily task with excitement and sincerity, ded dedicated to the truth. And whatever it is, it has been enough. Thank you very much.